This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Please visit calcedon.edu to download or purchase this book. The Philosophy of the Christian Curriculum, Russus J. Rushtuni, Ross House Books, Vallecito, California. Part 2. Chapter 1. History versus Social Science. Increasingly in the 20th century schools, the teaching of history has either given way to, or been radically infected by, the concept of social science. The approach of the social sciences to history, or to any field of study, is governed by two basic premises. First, history and society must be studied scientifically, that is, in terms of purely naturalistic considerations, without reference to God or to any eternal law. This methodology of necessity requires, ultimately, a materialistic philosophy of history. The presupposition of this methodology is anti-Christian. God and a Christian purpose and meaning are denied to history. The motive force of history can only be from within history. Second, since a scientific method gives paramount importance to experiment, a scientific society must be an experiment in scientific planning. Since controls are basic to experimentation, in order to produce a valid result, a totalitarian society is the goal of the social sciences, in that freedom is destructive to planning and human engineering. The social sciences, therefore, are hostile to freedom in any historic Christian sense. Freedom has no place in the laboratory of society. History taught as social science is, therefore, the story of man's struggle to liberate himself from God and superstition, to find himself, in terms of science, in independence of God and heaven, and a life lived in terms of exclusively this worldly considerations. Modern history texts are written as the story of man's evolution upward to the liberating world of science. Thus, a particularly well-known history text for high school world history introduces itself to the students by declaring, quote, To pack a suitcase for a journey is more fun than to fill a box with odds and ends and put it in storage. When you prepare for a journey, you have a purpose, end quote. What, then, is the purpose of world history? Quote, the courses you take in school are part of the baggage you pack for the most important journey of all, your life, end quote. With reference to world history specifically, quote, in this course, you will survey the marts of humanity from earliest times to the present and learn about the great triumphs and tragedies of mankind. In other words, you will make human experience available to you. End quote. For the authors, there is no law beyond man. The autonomy of critical thought is a basic assumption, and the only source of law is man. One of the conclusions of the book is a summary statement concerning law. The Ten Commandments are seen humanistically as designed to forbid, quote, acts that would spread discord within the group, end quote. Earlier, quote, all laws were believed to be divine commands or revelations, end quote. The modern era changed that, quote, later, with the growth of democracy, people chose their own governments, governments that derived, quote, their just powers from the consent of the governed, end quote. The laws of a state thus became an expression of the collective will and conscience of the citizens. But the highest purpose of law and religion remained the same, to promote the welfare, the harmony and the cooperation of men in society. End quote. This, quote, highest purpose of law and religion, end quote, is clearly and obviously humanism. The writers, in fact, see no other purpose. In the teacher's manual, the, quote, up-to-date objectives of the world history course in the high school curriculum, end quote, are clearly spelled out so that the teacher will not fail to understand and teach in terms of this basic humanism. Number one, to see that many types of problems facing mankind have been persistent through the ages in various cultures. Number two, to realise that the pace of change in human affairs has been accelerated throughout history, exemplified most vividly by the changes in the 19th and 20th centuries. Number three, to appreciate that the cooperative efforts of ever larger groups have advanced civilization, and that the breakdown of cooperation and a resulting disunity 
have been backward steps in the history of mankind. Number four, to understand the significance of man's increasing control of his environment, the enormous benefits, the great responsibilities, and the degree of dangers. Number five, to know about and to understand the development of other nations and regions of the world with which we now have such close contact, so that we may have a fuller appreciation of contemporary world problems. Number six, to gain a background for understanding the decisions that our government now must make, which in turn affect all parts of the globe. Number seven, to appreciate the strength of endurance that mankind has had to experience in order to achieve his present status. End quote. It should be noted that this textbook is far more conservative than most in its political perspective, although its view is clearly one of political and economic interventionism. However, secular textbooks, whether conservative or radical, are agreed in their basic humanism. For Haynes, as well as all other writers of status textbooks, man makes history. Primary determination is in man's hands, for better or worse. From the biblical perspective, God is a determiner of history. The young reformed Martin Luther reflected on the events he was engaged in and declared, quote, God alone is in this business. We are seized so that I see we are acted upon rather than act. End quote. Looking back 20 years later, he again asserted that everything had happened by divine counsel. For Luther, history is the work of God. Headley's excellent summary of Luther's views of history gives the biblical position clearly. Quote, With his conviction that God is the ground of historical causation, Luther stands within the tradition of Paul and Augustine. Only God could be at the root of all temporal events. At the same time, the theocentric position separates him from modern historical understanding. The difference is not limited to the problem of causation, but appears in its two immediate implications that every action derived from God gives unity and meaning to history, and secondly, because man is the instrument of God, one is denied the luxury of being a spectator. Man is constantly being acted upon and serves as a cooperator in this action. This unbroken activity of God pushes man into an unbroken cooperation in history. In such a situation, there can be no dead history and no flight from history. End quote. These two perspectives are mutually exclusive. Either God is God or man is God, and history is either basically God's work or it is man's work. The Christian teaching of history cannot halt between these two opinions. History is not a social science. It is a theological science because it is an aspect of God's creation. The Christian view of history as it appeared very early, saw the world outside of Christ as darkness. Christians were fully aware of the achievements of ancient cultures, but they were also intensely aware of their degeneracies and their willful rebellion against God. As a result, Christian historiography termed everything outside of Christ, quote, the Dark Ages, end quote. Petrarch removed the term, quote, Dark Ages, end quote, from classical pre-Christian times, to call the thousand years of Christianity by that title. The Renaissance and subsequent humanism accepted this term happily, and, although it later limited the centuries so termed, humanism held basically to a concept of Christianity as darkness. Humanism and science were equated with light, so that, only with the 19th century, the dawn of Darwinism and secular education was the light seen as coming into its own. The question, of course, is what constitutes light and what constitutes darkness. If it is technology, the ancient engineers were often amazingly skilled in this respect. But more was involved in, quote, light, end quote, than these things. The, quote, Middle Ages, end quote, were marked by no small social progress and architectural genius, and the earlier era saw a remarkable flowering of inventive genius and application. But for the modern mind, the key to quote-unquote light, to true historiography, is the secularization of history in terms of the autonomy of critical thought. Quote, light, end quote, means unbelief. The reaction of educators to 
quote, hippie and cold culture is more congenial than to orthodox Christianity. Anti-Christianity in its every form is viewed as an aspect of, quote, light, end quote, whereas biblical faith means, quote, the dark ages, end quote. Christian education cannot view the modern era in its own light. It must be seen as a dark age, a period of growing unbelief in the God of Scripture, a time of rising statism and totalitarianism, an age of sometimes comfortable slavery, which is inescapably slavery still. The effect of evolutionary thinking on historiography has been very great. One of its central products is the stage theory of development. Variations of this theory appear in a variety of thinkers, in Marx, Spengler and Vogelin. The various stages of historical development are marked by a, quote, leap in being, end quote, or by a new phase of law as the current law of their being, or by the organismic limitations of a particular stage of growth. Indeed, instead of an objective law, there is an imminent law which is expressive of the historical moment. Feudalism worked because it was expressive of that stage of development, and capitalism worked as a law of another stage in man's development. And no overall law governs all things, save a change premised on dialectical materialism or a related philosophy. Each society is, quote, right, end quote, in terms of its own stage of growth. Thus, Claude Levi Strauss, French anthropologist, has declared, quote, A primitive people is not a backward or retarded people. Indeed, it may possess a genius for invention or action that leaves the achievements of civilized peoples far behind, end quote. This scholar's basic premise is a rejection of the concept of truth, and this he likes in savage societies. Quote, what primitive man seeks above all is not truth, but coherence. Not the scientific distinction between true and false, but a vision of the world that will satisfy his soul. End quote. The Christian can agree that the savage is not primitive. He is like all men, a child of Adam. His problem is not primitivism, but degeneracy. To equate Christian cultures with those of Africa, and to demand appreciation of Africa's past and present, as many textbooks, including Bruins Haynes, do, is to ask us to endorse and accept degeneracy. Such an approach converts Africa from a mission field desperately in need of God's saving grace into a sister culture of equal dignity and character. To accept this premise is to reject Christianity. As a matter of fact, Levi Strauss's ostensible Catholicity of acceptance is very clearly a rejection of Christian civilization and the concept of truth, as Tris Trobig makes clear. In commending his savages, Levi Strauss is damning Christian culture and its concern for the truth. In its every form, the stage theory of development is relativistic, and the further this gospel is developed, the more radically does its relativism govern it. Levi Strauss simply pressed his Marxist and existentialist presuppositions to their logical conclusion. Thus, as we have seen, first, for Christian historiography, history is not a social science. It is a theological science. Second, it is a theological science because God, not man, is the sovereign Lord of all creation. Third, the dark ages of history are therefore the non-Christian eras and areas because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The basic criterion of life is thus Christ, not science. Fourth, Christian historiography rests on the concept of absolute truth, a personal truth, Jesus Christ, and it is thus hostile to historical relativism. Its attitude towards pagan cultures is not one of appreciation, but of evangelism. The Christian must oppose teaching designed to foster world brotherhood on humanistic terms. The standard remains not appreciation, but evangelism. Fifth, for the Christian historian and teacher, the basic textbook is the Bible. History is viewed from its perspective. Moreover, the Bible gives us the one valid chronology for ancient history. The whole of the Old Testament gives us a meticulous, precise, and extensive account of genealogies which are a part of the inspired and infallible text. We need to be reminded of that fact, since the tendency to underrate or overlook the genealogical tables 
is so great, but they plainly give us a chronology for world history. Phil Philip Moreau noted some years ago, quote, In other words, if we take it that the lifetime of mankind has been something less than 6,000 years, and there is no evidence at all for a longer term of human experience, then we have the remarkable fact that for about three-fifths of the entire period, there is no chronological information whatever except in the Bible. Whereas, on the other hand, during that same period, wherein other records are, as regards chronology, a perfect blank, the chronology of the Bible is most definite and complete. End quote. A belief in the Bible cannot be taught if we fail to take it seriously in its every aspect. The Bible gives not merely a chronology of history, but the meaning, purpose and direction of history. History is governed not by the philosophy's, quote, omnipotence of criticism, end quote, but by the omnipotence of the triune God. It cannot be understood apart from him and his word. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit reconstructionistradio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.